Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Popovich. I'm the founder of uh, One Philosophy Consultancy in uh, Kiev, Ukraine, um, co-founder of Ukraine Crisis Media Center and founder of a platform called weareukraine.info. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all at, uh, I think, the first uh, webinar of a very new initiative. It's called Ukraine Communication Support Network, uh, which uh, I have the honor to co-chair together with David Gallagher. Um, and it's a joint initiative of um, PRSCA and uh, ICCO. Um, and we are extremely privileged that uh, numerous um, public relations and communications um, initiatives and organizations all across the world um, are supporting us in um, our efforts. Um, essentially, it's, uh, it's an initiative that um, is looking um, at the context of uh, um, the latest um, full-scale um, war that Russia launched against Ukraine on February 24th. And um, it's um, bringing in um, all of the support from various communications professionals and various initiatives all across the world uh, to help support the suffering people um, in Ukraine. Um, we um, are rendering support to different uh, government authorities in Ukraine, uh, to various humanitarian causes, um, to the humanitarian relief efforts, to the displaced people who are still in Ukraine, and uh, the millions of those, unfortunately, who had to flee uh, their homes uh, to safety. Um, I myself uh, woke up to the sounds of explosions in Kiev on February 24th. And um, I think just as many millions Ukrainians had uh, my life and the, that of my family and my team completely disrupted um, uh, during those um, 48 days um, since then. Since then, I think everything's changed for us because we've seen the unimaginable brutality uh, of the Russian army towards the Ukrainian civilians since the very first days of the war. Um, 180 three kids have been um, kid, kids have been killed since the beginning of the war and we are not um, counting unfortunately not able to even count those in these cities that are under siege and, and occupation. Um, 342 children are wounded. Um, the extent of um, Ukrainian parents being worried for the lives of, of their children is such that some are putting the contact numbers of relatives on the backs of the Ukrainian children in case they get killed, because the chance for that is, is that high. Um, it's thousands now war crimes that have been registered by the general prosecutor's office. It's unimaginable suffering that's being brought by the fact that we cannot um, fulfill um, humanitarian corridors. Just recently, even last week in Kramatorsk, we saw how the Russian army um, sent a missile strike on the evacuation um, of uh, people who, who were just waiting to, to flee the war. And the toll, death toll of, of, of um, in, in Kramatorsk now is 57 and over 100, 100 wounded. So as every day we see the harsh and brutal reality of, of that war, we understand that it's been being prepared for years and years. Unfortunately, um, in my study of um, the Russian propaganda um, with the Ukraine Crisis Media Center and Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group, we saw how the consciousness of the Russians was being prepared for this war four years before. Um, the uh, Ria Novosti article that appeared last week, which basically um, very clearly uh, says that the goal of the Russian Federation in this war is to exterminate the Ukrainian nation and the exterminate the Ukrainian identity and basically kill anyone who um, is like me, who uh, feels Ukrainian, who respects Ukrainian flag, who speaks Ukrainian language, um, who would love for Ukraine to be a free and democratic and peaceful nation we've been uh, up until this war. Um, this is the clear intention. It's been communicated and the ground for that has been set by dehumanizing uh, in the eyes of uh, the Russians, of the Ukrainian nation, um, and not just Ukrainians, because uh, our studies have shown that also uh, the Europeans, the European countries, the European values have been perceived for long in Russia as uh, decadent, as such that needs to be fixed. Um, and that's exactly what's now being done with uh, these um, harsh and brutal methods of terror, 
um, that um, sent millions of Ukrainians uh, to flee. And that's why we need all the possible um, support in, in so many areas. And uh, I just wanna, before we pass on into and go into, into the discussion, uh, thank David personally for him kind of taking the time from from his life to set up this initiative to invite me and other members of the steering committee who are now now reviewing dozens of submissions from different agencies and individuals who uh, would like to pro bono help Ukraine in, in its time of need. Uh, as a Ukrainian, I can say that um, we will not forget those who are friends in, in times of need. And um, I truly believe that um, supporting Ukraine right now is actually helping the humanity win because the future of humankind, the kind of life we will have afterwards um, is being decided uh, in Ukraine right now. So your support is extremely, um, your support is extremely valuable for us uh, and uh, we will not forget it. I would like to introduce uh, my colleague from Ukraine um, to begin on this panel. Volodymyr Shiko is Director General of the Ukrainian Institute. Um, it's a public diplomacy arm of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Uh, I have the honor to serve on the board of Ukrainian Institute and to see how um, they as an institution um, have um, flourished in the since their inception a couple of years ago. And um, they have um, this task of continuing to explain Ukraine to the international audiences um, against so much of uh, Russian disinformation, against the huge resources of uh, Russian propaganda, and um, to meet um, the need that all of a sudden I think has ar ar arisen in, in so many places in the world, which is to learn more about Ukraine, learn, learn more about its culture, learn more about the people who um, express so much of the bravery and courage and resilience um, that we see uh, during this war in all of its, all of its uh, horrific uh, days. Um, Volodymyr, um, I'd like to, you know, to ask you to share sort of what are the challenges and what are the priorities in your and your team's work? Um, your team is not large, but it's extremely talented and very, very passionate. Um, how are your days going on right now and what are the priorities you are focusing your attention right now? Um, thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much, David. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. Um, we, as a team of um, around 50 people, are working hard uh, since basically the first day of the invasion on the 24th of February uh, to do two things, to get Ukrainian story and voices and cultural voices across to the rest of the world and to reduce um, Russian cultural presence in the world by uh, asking the international cultural community to suspend cooperation with Russia and particularly with Russia state funded or state controlled institutions that have uh, been for decades instrumentalized and used by Russia as a tool of uh, political propaganda and manipulation of public opinion in other countries. So our objectives, I think, are twofold, therefore. Um, and Natalia was right to say that, you know, suddenly on the 24th of February, the world, or at least a big part of the world, just suddenly discovered this biggest country, biggest European country right in the middle of Europe that was unjust, I mean, completely in, a victim of unjustified uh, and, and violent attack from its, from its neighboring, uh, from its neighboring country which led to a huge surge of attention and, and um, passion to learn more about Ukraine, to learn more about our past, our present, about the origins of this war, about Ukrainian identity and the complexities of our history and the experience of our civil society that has been uh, rapidly um, developing and, and uh, in the aftermath, particularly of the Revolution of Dignity in 2014, uh, which, uh, which, which is a serious succession of events that ultimately led to a full-on uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine this year. So as a team, we are responding to that overwhelming demand from cultural institutions, from cultural practitioners, from media, from editors, journalists, and um, other communicators who are genuinely willing to invest their time, to invest, to invest their, uh, their uh, capacities and resources and, and, uh, and, and time indeed 
to uh, to help Ukraine tell its story to the world, to tell to tell human stories of uh, those who you know had to change their professions or volunteer uh, in the army or be drafted to the Ukrainian armed forces, or uh, engage in other occupations and other professions that uh, help us you know collectively fight uh, fight this war on every single front and also our work um, a lot of, of it has to, has to do with uh, with uh, the russian disinformation efforts that um, have been omnipresent all around the world um, because as natalia again said russia um, in, in, in various statements made by uh, Putin himself, or in this uh, infamous article in Ria Novosti just a couple of days ago, Russia has made it very clear that it aims to deconstruct, destroy uh, Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian uh, pre cultural presence, uh, Ukrainian agency in the world. And Russia has been doing so by uh, spreading false narratives, by, by twisting public opinion, by manipulating history, uh, effects and, um, and narratives that are present, for example, in Western academia pertaining to Ukraine, thereby stripping Ukraine of its agency, stripping Ukraine of its cultural voice. And I think you will agree with me that, you know, cultural voice and communications are as important in this war as military warfare. Of course, the Ukrainian armed forces are the forefront, the most violent and terrible front of this war. But I think our job, our collective job, right, behind their backs is to safeguard Ukraine in the information space and invest our time and effort to get our stories across, to fix what's been damaged by Russia and to offer a genuine alternative to those, to those voices. So our job is not to say, no, they're wrong. Our job is to say, here we are. This is what we stand for. This is the issues that we're dealing with today. How we imagine and envision our history, as I'm very confident, the So, um, excuse me, can you hear me? I'm still online, right? Yes, you are. Um, I think there was a slight, uh, slight, uh, you know, loss of connection. But uh, yes, you are. Great. Apologies for the for the weak connection. So, um, I would uh, urge us to uh, to think and to discuss how uh, we, as communicators, as professionals, can help spread the word internationally about what, uh, for example, what are the ways to help Ukraine through um, donations, through humanitarian aid, through volunteering, through spreading uh, verified information from uh, trusted sources to make the world community, the global community know what's going on here. Not to let the world forget about Ukraine, because this is also very important. We are conscious that this overwhelming attention will not last forever, right? But we have to keep the momentum going because every single day, every single day of world's attention to Ukraine helps Ukraine win with, you know, political uh, uh, opinions changed with more uh, weapons transported to Ukraine. That's very important as well. And through all the you know, information activities that we, um, that we may um, employ to, uh, to help the Ukrainian cause. And of course, spread the word about um, the destruction of cultural heritage. This is very important to hold Russia accountable in, uh, in the international tribunal and in international courts of justice. Uh, all the facts of, uh, of war crimes committed in Ukraine have to be made public to international audiences. Um, and um, of course, Ukrainian culture and cultural interventions on, on different levels and different uh, formats. Um, I'm talking about uh, you know, very traditional uh, manifestations of that, of that, such as, you know, film screenings or, or literary evenings or solidarity events organized by Ukraine, uh, uh, for Ukraine internationally, but also, you know, less, more kind of more asymmetric interventions, uh, pop-up um, projects that are indeed happening all over the world. And we are, we're, we're seeing them happen, you know, this is completely grassroots, bottom-up um, initiatives. All of that needs communication support. All of that needs publicity. All of that needs storytelling. And I would 
like us to, uh, to to keep that in mind and indeed to think of what we in our in our individual roles could do to uh, uh, to basically collect that need from various actors based in Ukraine and elsewhere and to think how we uh, individually again or, or in teams uh, can respond to that and that would be very very much appreciated. Thank you, Volodya, and, and, and I can tell you that uh, I'm very excited by, you know, the submissions and the projects that are now kind of in the works as part of you, you know, Ukraine Communication Support Network. One of them, I think, from Lynn PR is actually um, a narrative guidelines, right? Something that can be used by um, anyone who wants to help Ukraine and not just to fight and counter Russian disinformation, but also think of these uh, examples of the resilience of Ukrainians or its culture or motives that that, that can be properly um, communicated. I think uh, the, the narrative book that they've prepared and, and um, I understand want to kind of update uh, is uh, on an ongoing basis is something that anyone um, can use. And also uh, you've mentioned uh, the types of asymmetric projects because of course um, numerous res resources and, and uh, um, efforts need to go into providing um, Ukraines with the heavy weapons we need now to uh, counter the Russian army. Um, just uh, today I was reading that after the meeting was um, Putin, Austrian Chancellor had said that uh, the offensive in the East um, should not be uh, underestimated because, uh, you know, even more brutality, unfortunately, is being promised to Ukrainians. So that's the first cause. Uh, but the second one, of course, is an, an asymmetry. And in a cultural place, we, we can afford that. So, for example, one of the projects that we are doing on behalf of We Are Ukraine is called Ukraine Street, which is exactly an asymmetric type of affair because we're only asking for something very immaterial but very important to um, enter, to help Ukraine enter the streets of um, the world cities. Uh, where right now Russian consulates or embassies are located uh, and rename them as Ukraine streets or the streets of Ukrainian heroes or the streets of Ukrainian cities. Since Russia wants to deny Ukraine our agency, um, I just think it's a very simple way to remind them that nations cannot just be wiped out of the face of the earth um, as long as there are uh, people who uh, represent them, and that's one of the just just you know one or two of the projects as part of the initiative. Maybe David will mention a few more, or um, will also introduce um, uh, other speakers of this panel. Thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. That was uh, that was fantastic and and right on message as you would expect. And I'm glad to hear that we we're all kind of feeling hearing the same. Uh, call to action. You know, when when the war first broke out, within uh, a day or so, I, I saw an article in Provoke Media that Natalia had written, and, and we didn't actually know each other then, which seems crazy since we speak several times a day now. But um, but I was I really felt like you were writing to me, um, and of course you weren't. You didn't know me, but um, it, I read it as as almost a letter to me, as as someone who's been in this industry for a long time. Who has run agencies large and, and small and, and know what it's like to worry about the safety of your of your colleagues your friends your family uh it, it really woke me up and um and kind of motivated me to, to see what what i could do with with the uh with my network and, and with the uh with the industry at large so thank you uh for, for for that um you know it was it was motivating from the beginning the response from this industry i mean hundreds of agencies raised their hand and said we'd like to get involved dozens and then hundreds of government agencies, humanitarian causes said, we'd like some help. Uh, originally, when, when Natalia and I first set up the network, we had hoped that maybe this would be like a, a matchmaker service. So we could, we could match agencies with specific causes and interests. And it was just too complex and too much at the beginning, and frankly, too slow for us to shine a light on the types of projects that we thought could be helpful immediately to the people of Ukraine, and immediately as the situation evolved, you know, at, at first there was this this fog of misinformation and propaganda, and that persists. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, literally, battlefield conditions shifted, and we needed to be aware and sensitive to that. Uh, a humanitarian crisis emerged overnight and uh, spilled into to, to many other surrounding places. We needed to be aware of that. Uh, so it, it was it was difficult at first to say here's what the specific need is without cutting off interest or opportunities from those uh, who uh, you know maybe got into the process a little bit late. 
So what we've come up with just for context for now, and I hope it does continue to continue to evolve and maybe become a, a matchmaker service of some sort where you can swipe left for communication support or swipe right for an agent uh, for a humanitarian cause to, to get behind. Uh, but now we're starting to create a database of what we think are um, state of the art communications programs for the people of Ukraine. Um, some are solely Ukrainian based, some are much more internationally focused. Uh, and we hope that this will inspire those who are either looking for help or looking to give help to see good examples of things that they can do. They can either help amplify, they can participate, collaborate directly, or they can recreate projects in their own markets, their own language, their own, their own places. So in some ways, it's not as broad as we'd like to, to have been at the beginning, but in other ways, it's much faster for us to, to highlight uh, ideas, creativity, and opportunities to collaborate. Um, all of this you can follow uh, on Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or the hashtag U Ukraine Com support. Uh, and we put new resources up almost daily uh, on the PRCA website. So that's just a little bit of background about how we got to, to, to where, we, uh, where we are. In that process, um, we found uh, a few projects, some of which began before we started our project that we thought were really worth uh, highlighting. And I'm very happy to have two colleagues, uh, both based in the UK. Uh, as a matter of disclosure, I, say I work with both of these ladies closely, so I know their business as well. And I had a little bit of a head start understanding what they were trying uh, to do. I take no credit for, for what either of them are doing, other than recognizing that it was work that we might want to highlight to a, to a broader audience. And I'll start with, with, with you, Shayoni. Uh, Shayoni Lin is founder and CEO of, of Lin PR, uh, a consultancy based squarely on behavioral science and understanding exactly what people need to hear and how they hear it in, in order to, uh, to respond um, in, in positive ways, both for themselves and their communities. Um, and she has a specialist unit that focuses uh, uh, specifically on, on misinformation, the misinformation cell. And as Natalia said, Shioni, you, you were creating pretty much from hours after the war actually broke out, this, this misinformation guide. And I do think it's remarkable and, and frankly has use well beyond uh, this, this horrific situation and that it helps you understand how propaganda is built and then how to counter it. And, and it's not just out shouting the other guy. It's not just coming up with uh, bigger numbers. It's actually understanding how stories are built and how stories are spread and how to come up with, with better narratives. So maybe you could just tell us kind of how you got involved, why you got involved, and then, and then what other communi communicators can do to, to help the project. Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. So um, yeah, it was really powerful listening to both of you and your lived experiences. And for us, it was really important at LNPR to be able to contribute in some way. We uh, were very cognizant that we ran the misinformation cell, which was the UK's first anti-mis disinformation service for PR and communication. So that seemed like an obvious space for us to get involved in. Um, and disinformation clearly has played such a big role in, in this information, in, in this war. Um, we tend to think of it as a, the best response to a lie isn't a fact, it's a deeper truth. And this is the kind of approach we take at the misinformation cell. So, this is a very complex and chaotic information environment. People aren't objectively analyzing any information in any depth. The multiple things affect how people receive and respond to messages, such as emotions, such as lived experiences, and also our inherent cognitive biases that affect how we make decisions. And that's from my experience of, of being behavioral science communications experts. And we know that propaganda is made up of truth and also lies. So fact checking leaves that emotional response unchallenged. Um, and as communicators, we all know that people buy stories, not facts. So what we did in, and we worked at pace on top of client work and pitch work, but it was really important for us to contribute in some, some respect to this space. We analyzed official Kremlin propaganda, unofficial Kremlin spokespeople, pre predominantly in the UK and the US, and also fact-checking services to um, identify the key themes that were coming out in the early stages of the war. So we studied these themes for common narratives, we mapped these against objective truths, and they, we used that to build and develop counter-narratives. So these counter-narratives are based on that emotional response. You know, if people are viewing mis- and disinformation, and largely disinformation in this particular case, Case and uh, emotion is affecting how they perceive, respond, and then amplify that message. We need to fight that with emotion. So our counter narratives, along with our content recommendations, were based on that uh, qualitative aspect of, of human behavior. And it was uh, created to build resilience amongst audiences to, to this propaganda. So we also, at the same time, actually, this was the next report, we also analyzed how the far right ecosystem within the UK, how they were. 
um, and whether they were and how they were pushing Putin's narratives for their own benefit. Um, and, and we know from our work that they increasingly are doing so. So it's not just, as Natalia says, not a threat just to Ukraine. There's far-reaching far -reaching consequences and consequences to us back here in the UK as well. Um, so I, I think what made our response toolkit really um, stick with audiences was whilst many across the world were looking at automated tools that were scraping Twitter data, and it's limited in what you can do with automated tools. We were going into much harder to reach spaces to monitor how these narratives were developing and how they were changing. And we use qualitative data, which is uh, often undervalued in social media narrative analysis, but you just need to know where to look. And then you can build up the solid picture of the key narratives that are at play to then develop those counter narratives and the content recommendations that will start then pushing and fighting against that disinformation. So we used quantitative for scale and qualitative for insights to create more of a rounded picture of what was going on. Um, and then our content recommendations uh, resulted as a, as an, uh, was a result of that. So a lot of energy, I think, fighting disinformation is focused on fact checking. And I keep going back to a lie. To fight a lie, you need to look at the deeper truth. So we take that step back and we look at the bigger picture to really understand what story Putin was trying to sell to the world and then identify the core narratives that people would subscribe to, would use and share on the social media to amplify impact of fighting that disinformation. And it's been it's been really widely um, received, which has been brilliant. It's uh, been downloaded over three and a half thousand times. There's absolutely no paywall. You can go onto our website. So one click download, we're not collecting any information. Um, it's been shared across the world, it's been shared in Ukraine, it's been shared in Russia. We've heard anecdotally about Russian um, friends and colleagues using it to arm discussions with the families who may have fallen, um, you know, it might be enchanted by the disinformation. We've seen it on the uh, Ukraine subreddit, it's been flagged in Dubai, it's been taught in lecture theatres here in the UK. So it's been really great to see that um, a service that we offer, which is for clients, can be used at such speed to make some real world impact in some small way to support what's happening in Ukraine. Thanks, Joni. Is, is there a specific thing that you would like the community to do now? I mean, more downloads, more shares, more using it for Absolutely. their own? Absolutely. Obviously, the more you can download, the more you can share it. Um, the hashtag is uh, post content fight Putin. Uh, so if you could use the hashtag, it helps us then find that content and then be able to see how, how far reaching um, the work has been. But also, if you find if you if you land up in a rabbit hole, uh, within the internet, you know, some depths, uh, hopefully not, but that's what we do. But if you do find disinformation that's out, outside of the mainstream, letting us know at contact olympia.co.uk. If you'd like to support our pro bono work, please get in touch as well. We, you know, we're a small team. Uh, we're doing it this on top of work. So the more hands, the better. So yeah, if you'd like to get involved, just get us, let us know or simply just download and share. I know at the very beginning that it was translated almost immediately into Ukrainian and Russian, and I, I think we're looking for other translations uh, as well, so that might be an easy way to, to help on that. So uh, uh, thanks for that. I just want to address a couple of questions before I, I come to you, Farzana. Um, Rod had asked whether we've seen any, any sort of fall off in media attention. Um, I, I think in my own view, conditions on the field are so still so shocking that it's still commanding a lot of attention. But but Natalia and I were in another discussion yesterday, and I think we agreed that we, we are concerned about the inevitable fatigue uh, that, that sets in when, when people, especially outside of the immediate uh, arena of, of conflict, you know, just become tired of, of hearing uh, bad news uh, that they maybe feel they don't have a lot of power to, to address. So I think it's something that we're interested in, in fighting, uh, making sure that we keep the interest on the right things in the right ways. Um, not so positive that we're ignoring Real tragedy and loss, but um, but not so negative that we we don't we we don't give people a, a way forward, uh, you know, something to hope for. So any creativity on those lines, I think, would be welcome. I think that's kind of inevitable. Um, I just want to come to Farzana. We're kind of halfway through our our, our time. Um, so Farzana is founder and CEO of a of an international agency, London based, uh, called Curzon. Um, she and I have worked together on on a few Ukrainian related projects, and I'll, I'll let her talk about kind of her favorites and, and why she got involved with this personally. But, but I will just say now that uh, when this conflict first, when this war first started, um, people were struggling with their statements on, on how to treat uh, their clients, especially if they had clients in, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, and Farzana issued one of the, the least ambiguous, most powerful 
uh, messages I'd seen in terms of what her agency's uh, stance would be. And she did have some, uh, you know, uh, Russian clients in her past uh, and why. And, and she didn't just hide behind a written statement. She actually did it as a as a video straight to, to camera. And, and I hope if you, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll go to Curzon PR and take a look at it just because I, I think it shows the power of individual leadership and taking a stand and making sure that your people, your clients uh, understand what you stand for and, and, and why. So I just want to commend her uh, for that. And, and Farzana, I don't know where you wanted to start. The one I have in mind was work you're doing for the Ukrainian Justice Alliance, uh, which is a similar collection to what we're doing in comms and PR, but for lawyers. Uh, but then they need comm support too. So it kind of shows the uh, the interconnectivity of this ecosystem we're trying to create. Um, so I, wonder, I, I don't know if you want to start there or not, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you because I know you're doing a lot of great work in the space as well. Sure. Um, so, so for me, I, I guess, um, you know, watching the news uh, it was deeply personal. One of my best friends uh, is Ukrainian. Uh, I took my family to Odessa for holidays. Uh, I've worked in Ukraine for over a decade, uh, particularly in the arts and culture side with their arts institution, Mistetsky Arsenale, uh, also working with a lot of the Ukrainian artists. Um, so um, developed lots of warm friendships over the years. And um, as soon as it, it, it happened, uh, I, you know, I've got so many friends who are Ukrainian that uh, it was so hard to just passively watch the news and and I just felt as if my energy would be better sort of channeled uh, trying to do something positive and and I think all PRs whether you're an individual freelancer practitioner a small agency like myself working in a big agency I think we can all find ways to support and I think where there's a will there's a way um, so a few of the sort of areas that I found to um, to add support um, some of my friends are uh, lawyers and I heard through the grapevine uh, that they set up the Ukrainian Justice Alliance and it was spearheaded by uh, Mishkon Durea. And, uh, and what they've done is that they've set up a network of a number of different law firms. And I approached them and I said, can I as a PR firm join your alliance um, and support in terms of the communication uh, needs because I love what they're doing. They're working on a number of different initiatives. One is to, uh, to start the um, documentary evidence uh, case and start building in terms of um, building a future uh, case for war crimes. Um, and then the second that they doing is they're doing some research to find a legal pathway in how they can take sanctioned assets um, and see if they can legally find a pathway uh, in order to take those sanctioned assets and then um, apply those to rebuild Ukraine. Um, so they're actually finding legal pathways to help support not just the present situation in Ukraine, but also thinking medium term and long term. Um, I remember what the invasion of Crimea um, in 2014, and, uh, and there was a sort of big uh, focus in the media, but then there was media fatigue. And I think the concern about these situations is that uh, once a news cycle is over, um, a lot of people are thinking about sort of helping in terms of immediacy, but not really thinking about legacy and medium to long term. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, very important uh, for my, myself. So I think what the Ukrainian Justice Alliance are doing is fantastic. If you Google Ukrainian Justice Alliance, um, you know, you can find all the information. Please feel free to reach out to myself or reach out to them directly, um, because there's a number of um, um, initiatives that's happening within the alliance that the law firms are spearheading that require communication and advocacy. So, for instance, um, as and when they find a legal pathway uh, in order to find out how they can take the sanctioned assets and um, and redeploy the, um, the monetary uh, value to rebuilding Ukraine, uh, they would also need support in terms of um, advocacy and working out various people in the in political parties to see to see who can take um, take this these legal pathways and advocate uh, for making it a reality. So there there are public affairs aspects as well as media relations aspects. So there's a number of different areas that PR people can support. Um, the second area is at Chatham House. So Chatham House, um, the think tank, they wrote a report in mid-December and they put PRs on the naughty step. Uh, and it was basically a report on the kleptocracy and the insidious nature of Russian oligarch money in the UK and how it um, creates all sorts of problems because of donations to political parties, to uh, top tier universities, to building credibility for themselves, through aligning with various tra charities um, and so forth. And so the um, Chatham House report actually wrote um, a report of which one chapter is dedicated to PR people, how they as professional enablers were enabling 
uh, you know, Russian money um, that was linked to the Kremlin for their own ends. And so, um, so what? So, so I, I reached out to Chatham House, and I'm now working with their professor, where they're creating a separate report for the PR industry. Um, and um, but this time, I've asked them to actually engage with us as an industry before they write the report. Um, and um, and and also, hopefully, we're going to work together in creating a toolkit to help agencies to be careful in terms of due diligence on on who they're working for because one of the issues about um russian kremlin money is um you they don't just come knocking directly to the pr agencies their money often flows through a number of different organizations so you don't really know who you're working with and so chatham house is going to work uh, hopefully with our industry in helping us create these due diligence toolkits we're not a regulated industry other than obviously the public affairs element uh, like the legal profession so also uh, working with law firms to share their best practice and due diligence so that the pr firms can also have the same level of processes uh, in place because at the end of the day this is uh, also an information war and uh, PR people can unwittingly be um, utilized as um, as sort of puppets and, and agents without knowing where the actual money is coming from so that's one area that we're working with with um, with Chatham House the other is uh, pro bono work we, we set up a, um, a small team within uh, Curzon where we're providing pro, pro bono work to a number of different organizations and individuals from journalists that we know who are, who are on the ground freelance in in the viv and um, and we're setting up you know all sorts of um sort of media um, placements for them uh, we're also working with a, a couple of different venture funds that are set up to support um, the tech entrepreneurs i think what's very important about ukraine and also particularly countries that have sadly been subject to um to invasions is that it can sometimes be reduced in the public eye as you know here's a country um, that is just reduced by its um its, its war predicament but what we also need to understand is ukraine has immense uh, cultural uh, contributions which i've Person spent a decade working on, but also it's um, it's tech. It is a center of excellence for technology, um, and the um, and all of the um, incredible skills and innovations and resources um, that's in within Ukraine. Those entrepreneurs need support, and they need support as they are uh, as they are leaving Ukraine and settling in other countries temporarily. Um, and they also need support for their business in terms of continuity, as well as mentors around them. And um, so there's a couple of organizations that we're working with at the moment that are spearheaded by Ukrainian entrepreneurs and they want to help other Ukrainian entrepreneurs because some have um, a lot more sort of networks around the world and they've been able to re-establish themselves quite quickly um, and others who don't have that same level of network so we're work working with them to build um, various different structures within these organizations that will help them create some sort of mentoring as well as in due course set up a venture fund one of them is more institutional focused and working with the um, economic bank of Recon reconstruction and then the other is more work focused on tech entrepreneurs I think another area that us uh, as PR people can do is you know we often have clients who are very influential and sometimes they may need a little bit of a gentle nudge in terms of making a statement of where they stand in terms of support uh, one of our clients is, is one of the leading tech entrepreneurs in the world and so we have been working with him on, on creating a narrative that he's very passionate about that silicon valley should not just be in silicon valley there should be silicon valleys all across the world and particularly in countries like ukraine um, where they have not only the, the center of excellence but they also need to ensure that their you know, burgeoning tech industry is supported and grown. Um, and it's not just, we're not just thinking in terms of weapons and humanitarian supplies, but also in terms of preserving the, um, you know, the skills and the, the knowledge and the um, and incredible contribution that the Ukrainian entrepreneurs have made to the world and to ensure that continuity. Um, and so those are some of the areas that uh, we've been working on um, and yeah. That's it. Thanks, Farzana. You know, on a, on a scale of one to 10, you and Shayoni are like a, at a 12, I think, in terms of output and, and commitment, uh, which is great and commendable. Uh, my, my anxiety, though, is that people may be saying, I can't possibly do that much, give that much, um, you know, sacrifice that much for my, my day job to do it. So I would just uh, plea to everyone, you don't have to go that far. Uh, Natalia and I were saying yesterday, literally every like, every retweet every share uh, from other people's work helps. You'll, you'll expose other people to ideas they didn't have before. You'll inspire action that might not have uh, occurred to them before. Uh, so there are lots of ways to get involved with this. And I think once you do a little bit, you'll find it's, it's, it's so rewarding and, and, and so uh, well received from, the, from your, your communities that you'll, you'll find it easier to, to move further to a, to a 12 than a, than a zero. But thank you guys both for your, 
your leadership. I just want to answer one question and then Natalia, see if you had any comments on either of the projects we just uh, spoke about. So um, the questions come up about job boards, especially for people from the comms and, and media space. Uh, I know that national associations within ECO are setting up their own reverse job boards. Uh, I've heard of one in Poland. I think there's one in Lithuania, Romania. There's one in development here in the UK. Um, these are complicated, as you can imagine. Visas alone uh, complicate the, the, the process. It's one of the aspects that Farzana's team is working on with the Ukrainian Justice Alliance is to see if there's some, some streamlining for or resourcing for uh, visa help. That's, it's, it's a very complicated question. So not to negate the, your, your question, but say that it is something that's, that's under review. Uh, and I want to acknowledge a lot of the bigger networks. Uh, Natalia's organization is part of the Weber Shanwick network. I came from an Omnicom group. The big groups are working very hard to move people into slots to, to, to new roles temporarily uh, while, while the war goes on. So there is activity, but unfortunately, there's not a single place I can, I can direct you to. And there was a question about uh, a database of humanitarian causes. I don't want to, I, I don't think I can break this link and go find it for you. So I'll post it on the, on the PRCA Twitter feed uh, afterwards, because I'm afraid I won't get back in if I do that. But I wanted to, wanted to say, I've seen your question, your comment, and I will, I'll add a link as soon as I, I can. But Natalia, I mean, from your perspective, you hear about these ideas, how do you feel? What, what's your comment? What's your reaction? Well, I think, first of all, you know, extreme uh, gratefulness to, um, you know, to, to both of you for putting out your, your teams and the agencies to provide so much support to, to Ukraine. I think this is fantastic. And um, also uh, the focus on business continuity, I think, extremely is important. Uh, in the tech industry, in the creative communications um, uh, industry, um, it's um, it's heartbreaking on one hand, I think, for many of the founders and entrepreneurs, um, including myself, to see some of the team members now living in so many different countries and having sometimes to work on, on other teams. But at the same time, we need people to get through the difficult times. And if you can um, hire the agencies and Ukrainians teams to do you know, special projects, I think this is what helps them retain uh, their team spirit and also um, their business continuity in times of war. Um, I think where we have particular you know, challenges, I think it was there was this question and I just wanted to comment on it in terms of uh, the fatigue or, um, well, first of all, I, I do believe that the hot stage of this war will continue, unfortunately, and um, that will keep um, Ukraine on the um, agenda. But where we, there are areas um, um, outside of Europe, outside maybe of more of an Anglo-Saxon world where we um, feel that Russian disinformation is still prevailing. And I think this is where we uh, do need more of the support of the communications industry uh, to help us more with um, Africa, with Latin America, with Southeast Asia, um, where maybe Ukrainian um, identity or culture was not, you know, represented as much and whereas for whom the war is a little bit further. If you look at, um, at the level of voting at the United Nations, or if you look at the level of condemnation of uh, the actions of the Russian leadership, uh, we need more of that coming from those you know, those parts of the world. So we are working on that um, with, with our colleagues. And if you have any ideas or contacts or social capital or influencers that you can share with us, I'd be extremely grateful. In terms of getting involved, um, of course, um, every, every action counts. Um, we are Ukraine.info, for example, is not only the repository of truth and easy to share um, news about Russia-Ukraine war and the facts of resilience and the world support for Ukraine, uh, which I think is extremely important to showcase and, and to kind of keep that momentum going. But it's also um, kind of a digital platform where you can find some really easy to follow and act upon calls to action. I think every employee of any network or actually any corporation can write a letter to a company that still is operating in Russia. On our website, you can find template letters, you can find updated infographics, and uh, even the contacts of the people whom you should be targeting. Because unfortunately, until we raise the cost of war for Russia, it's going to keep feeding the war machine that is um, killing so many of the civilians and create, you know, creating this completely unnecessary suffering. Um, so I think one of those calls is, is very important. Another one is simply about the words. Um, I think when I was 
writing this this emotional article at the beginning um one of my first calls to action was even pre-war i was asking our network and clients not to work with the russian clients because for example for one philosophy we stopped working with any russian entity or any oligarchic in entity in 2014 and we were asking our partners to do the same and i'm glad that at least with the beginning of the war so many organizations stopped their relations with Russia and divested and exited Russia, but there's still a lot of companies that are still there. So one of the calls to action is about that. Another one is about the words of using proper words for saying war is war, criminal is criminal. It's not just any war, it's the war that Russia started, it's the war for which Russians are responsible. And like Prasanna said, for Ukrainians, it's extremely important to bring those responsible to justice. So when you use the language, we're asking everybody to use the language that is clear and, and in which you, your partners, your clients, your friends, um, you know, don't you use euphemisms. This is, I think, the least we can do to, the res you know, to respect everybody who already failed and, uh, and lost life in this war. So there are very simple calls to actions there. More complex ones, like, you know, to the ranking agencies to downgrade the ESG, uh, rankings of the companies operating in Russia to more simple ones like Street Ukraine Street or um, or um, Cold War War and, and, and others. And you can always join. And um, thank you again already to everybody who's committed their times, their time, and the teams, um, because um, we would, you know, without you, we won't be able to um, to win. And now that is that is a question of to be or not to be. Uh, for the Ukrainian identity. So um, it's extremely important that we have the support we need. Great, thanks. Thanks everyone. I, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to multitask, but I'm not good at it, looking at, <laughs> at questions and, uh, and, and chatter. Uh, I will find that link to the International Association of Risk and Crisis Communications database. It, um, I, it looks vetted. We, we looked at it as close as we could. We had both Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers look at it. Um, I, I can't say that it's 100% um, clean, but it looks pretty clean to us. And, and of course, they've edited it themselves. So I'll, I'll give you a link to that uh, as, as soon as we can. Um, we're a little bit over time right now. So unless there's any closing comments, I would uh, thank everybody for your time and, and attention. It, it says a lot that you, you give up a little bit of your time uh, to hear from people you may not know um, about uh, a cause that you read a lot about to just get a little more insight and a little more um, perspective. Um, I'll ask as we ask them to to, to start, our Ukrainian colleagues, any any uh, closing comments? Volodya, I already did comment. Uh, well, I just want to join you in thanking everyone for your time and attention and commitment to Ukraine. Um, and I may have seen a question that may be kind of related to uh, to, to what I uh, to, uh, to what I had to say, but we can continue the conversation. I think in a, in a, in a written correspondence, if you if you don't mind. We're out of time. Perfect. Thank you for your time as well. It was really important for us to hear from uh, from you both directly. So, um, all right. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll endeavor to persevere. Right. We'll keep moving on this and um, hopefully get more projects that we can share. Please take a look at what's already been posted. Find ways to amplify. Find ways to share and find ways to build on what's already been been done. Uh, so, thank you both. Thank you, Shaoni and Farzana, and, and thank you for your your hard work in this, this space. I hope it'll be, and I know it'll be inspiring to, uh, to others. So thank you for that. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye guys. Thanks. Thanks.